can't speak about my homeland without speaking Norse. This body of water up behind me is Strangford Loch. The town on the far shore is Strangford Town. And this stretch of water between the two shores is, well, this is the strong ford, the Strangfjord that the Norse found when they came here a millennium and more ago to raid, to trade, to settle, to build homes and to raise families. And their legacy and the legacy of countless others lies all around us. It's worth bearing this long history in mind as we think about race relations broadly understood to include migration, ethnicity and related matters in Northern Ireland. In this series, we'll try to dig into these themes, tapping into the research and the living experience of a wide range of voices to think about the riches of intercultural exchange. And I think there's a hunger uh, for a lot of people who do a lot of outreach work with us all year round to come together for a little celebration just to showcase what they have learned. And I think that has been the real strength of it. We'll look at the question of political representation. Um, the thing is, if you come from a different country, to Northern Ireland and you're not a Christian and certainly you don't feel you belong to this place. And I think it's still the same in 20, you know, 21. We look at the risk of exclusion amid inclusion. However, in these kinds of uh, power sharing agreements, what we have seen is that those who are expressly included will almost always lead to implicit or formal exclusion of people who aren't recognized by those groupings. So in Northern Ireland, that may include um, newcomers in my research, particularly looking at migrants and refugees and asylum seekers, but other groups as well. We'll look at long-standing prejudices faced by, among others, the traveler community. On the day that I started working, as mentioned, the race relations order came out um, and it was the first time travellers were recognised anywhere here or anywhere in these islands, in Britain or on the island of Ireland. So we're the first part of anywhere in the world to be seen as an ethnic or racial group, uh, which was a good starting point for me starting in a travel organisation. Um, before that, uh, it was perfectly legal to discriminate racially discriminate against travellers, Chinese people, Indian, Pakistani and um, African-Caribbean community. So it's perfectly legal for shop owners, pubs, restaurants, employers to say no travellers, no Chinese, no blacks. We'll look at recent challenges raised by Brexit. With Brexit, the challenge was that even though my environment or the people around me, my colleagues, my friend, we were all in the, in the same boat, so to speak, that no, perhaps you know majority of my friends didn't vote to leave. And even some of my friends that did vote to leave didn't vote with me in mind. You know, it wasn't like get Kaya out of the country, you know, get the immigrants out of the country. It was very much, you know, they bought into the economic side of things or, you know, the, the possible advantages. We'll look at policies that can help or sometimes hinder. There are a whole range of things, I think, in terms of building good relations. Um, it's important that people get to meet people. You can go out, deliver a lot of training, refugee awareness, migration awareness, talking about the situation. But I know that doesn't change hearts and minds. It maybe gives people a broad picture and addresses myths and misinformation. But what I think works is that in in conjunction with face-to-face -face things. So we have Belfast Friendship Club and a spin-off from that is Small Worlds where people will go out and represent their own communities, their own background, speak for themselves. And I think that's really important. Over the years, I've had the privilege to work with a whole number of organisations to secure really positive changes to legislation and policy. And... Um, you know, a good example of this 
is when as a whole sector, we came together to lobby for a change in the legislation that would guarantee all refused asylum seekers a right to access healthcare. We've mentioned intersectionality, so if we look at all, uh, you know, everybody who uh, who campaigns for for kind of minority rights, you know, if all the minorities come together, that they stop being minorities uh, uh, eventually. So I remember being at an event when it, it was literally like that, you know, so there was there was somebody from uh, BME communities and such community, such community, and everybody was wanting their specialized kind of legislation for for women's rights, for this rights, for that rights, and and then uh, at the very end, somebody came in to say it's like a bill of rights would go along. Would, uh, for Northern Ireland would go a long way to you know to protecting all those to addressing all those uh, all those so uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to uh, to unite uh, to unite those voices and work towards that one uh, that one piece of legislation that uh, that would be helpful to to all I would lay foundations for 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 all the others so uh, kind of politically speaking and from a personal point of view I also think that should be a priority for for activists. Uh, of, uh, of all creeds. My job is really to look at um, the laws, policies, processes that um, combine to cause migrant vulnerability. And then once we've identified the laws that do that, then we need to try and address those laws, get them changed, get the policies amended. And we'll be tapping into the sheer talent, ingenuity and energy that could be a source of power for our whole society, if we could only realise it. Yes, yeah, so a bit of my background would be, I've been brought up in Northern Ireland, I'm 20 years old. So I've been living in Northern Ireland for 17 years now. Uh, I've moved away for three, um, grew up, played for all the football uh, youth systems played for Northern Ireland up to under 19s. Um, I have a lot of like experience in football. I've done coaching when I was in England. Got my coaching badges. Um, yeah, so I'd say I'm a pretty active member in the Northern Ireland community as a whole in terms of representation. The whole, the whole idea about the African and Caribbean Chamber of Commerce, you know has to do with um, um, Africans and Caribbeans that are doing business in Northern Ireland or are looking at setting up their own business in Northern Ireland, whether it's a cleaning company, an accounting firm, you know, all sorts. You know, that means that there was confidence, you know, um, in the environment for us to say, you know, we can set up you know, these businesses in the community. Naturally, being by the kind of um, professional that I mean, um, having my own practice and being a business advisor and consultant, uh, tax advisor and accountant, all in one, uh, I think was just a natural thing for, for me to be nominated to head the organization. So we do it together. So yeah, we have a, build, a business, we build a custom PCs and uh, we do repairs and things like that. We're starting to expand. We're going to start expanding out soon and we're going to, I think we're going to actually rebrand. I think there's, there's work to be done. Um, I think uh, I, I think it's great at the minute. I think there's a lot, there's a lot of great organisations doing good work, up, uh, and especially in Northern Ireland. You've got Axonian and uh, people like that are sort of pushing, just pushing it just to generate the to government, they're doing big events, they're promoting their people, you know, I think it's great. Ultimately, it's, it's your choice how are you going to approach it, and I choose to approach everything from my business, to my identity, to where I'm from, with the approach of, I know what I stand for, I know what I represent, I know what I can contribute, I know what I can offer, I know what my expertise is, and Yes, I, I welcome growth, I welcome support. I want the government to be in a place where, you know, even though I'm Polish, I still want the same opportunities. I still want the freedoms. I still want to be able to contribute to the society as I have been, you know, for the, for the last number of years.
the strong ford that gives this place its name, the powerful tidal currents that flow through here every day are being investigated by scientists as a potential source of clean power for the 21st century. That's the strong part. What about the Ford? Well, looked at in one way, a Ford is a place where two shores are separated, but looked at in another, it's a connecting place. If you're prepared to get on the boat, you can connect and combine with the other shore and be connected to everything that lies beyond. And it's in those connections and combinations that a whole other source of power and kind of power may lie. <laughs>